And don't you just love a good pun or two? Stationary points. And look, do you see that? Yeah? You wonder what that's all about? Yeah, it's stationary. It was the best I could come up with. You try and Google a royalty-free image on stationary points. They're honestly not very exciting. So I went for the whole stationary. And if you are fortunate enough, lol, or cursed to actually be taught by me, that is the work I am hoping you will achieve by the end of the lesson today. So let's do a quick recap. And once again, because I can't choose anything other than a picture of a cap, Let's do a recap. We have, over the course of the modules, been dealing with lots of different functions, and we've been asked to draw them and move them. And in all cases, we have been asked to ensure that when we sketch the graph of the functions, we include the following things. Now, those of you in Australia, and I imagine around the world, because I should imagine maths is a universal language. Bonjour, ça va. You must make sure that you label all of the points on a graph that are important to you. Now, your teacher will have told you specifically for your country which points need to be done. And in Australia, it's pretty much everything you could do. So, for example, endpoints. This is tricky. This is really, really important. If you had a function where you had a limited domain, let's say between two and four mapped onto real, of f of x equals x squared plus two, for example. Now, that is pretty obvious that they are going to ask you for only a part of the graph, and that is the part that goes between two and four. Now, having drawn this, you know, with your y labeled and x labeled or f of x or whatever it is, because they have given you a domain, you have to put endpoints. Now, in this particular instance, I'm going to put two colored in circles because that shows the examiner the domain has been limited. Why are they colored in? Because my domain, if you look at these square brackets, includes both the values of two and four. If they hadn't included, if they had been round brackets, for example, if they'd been two comma four, then I would have drawn open circles at the end of my line. So first things first, endpoints are critically, critically important. Next, axes labels, as I've done there, Y and X, tick, that's really, really helpful. Function label, my advice to you is always, always, always write on the function, regardless of if the question's given it to you or not, just write on the function somewhere on the exam. X-axis intercepts and Y-axis intercepts. Now, in this particular instance, there are no intercepts. The example I've chosen there has no intercepts. But if I had this, for example, whoop, as my graph, and it had been x squared minus 2. Well, first things first, we know that value there will be at negative 2. Now, yes, you can just put that point there, and everyone will go, oh, yeah, but it's obvious it's minus 2. I would still make it, I would make it even more obvious by putting 0, comma, minus 2 beside that point. Formally put it in brackets, the actual point. Now, this point here, then, is another point you would have to find. How would you find that? Well, it's an x-axis intercept. It is where the y value is equal to zero. And because my function here is y equals, then I could solve it by doing x squared minus two. Yep, so x would be plus or minus root two. And again, in this situation, I'd put root two comma zero as my coordinate, regardless of whether you label the point on the axis as well. So x-axis and y-axis intercepts are really important. Any equations of any asymptotes? Now, neither of these graphs here have asymptotes. This one I've just shown here has probably a limited domain uh, because I've only got part of that squared graph. But if you have a hyperbola, for example, here is your hyperbola. And again, that's a really ropey drawing. You would put the dotted line on your graph, uh, the dotted line here, and you must, must label them. So that is the line x equals zero, and that is the line y equals zero. Please label your asymptotes. So, so important. And my advice is at least one coordinate out of side of those shown above. So again, I would just choose a coordinate on here and I would say three comma 11, right? Because when I put three into there, three squared is nine, nine plus two is 11. And I would just put a coordinate on there just in case. Now, one thing we've been able to do today, as I say here, is actually find the coordinates of turning points. Now you're going to say, yeah, we have, because we've done um, turning point form for quadratics. Yeah, okay, fair point. For a quadratic, it's very lucky that you have a number of ways 
of finding that turning point, completing the square, axes of symmetry, all sorts of different things. But what about cubics? What about cortex? What about all the other graphs there? Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's lesson on stationary points. Okay, first thing first, what is a stationary point? Oh, I love this, I love this. Again, this comes now massive across the rest of mathematics, all right? So please don't think that we're just gonna deal with it with this exercise and then we're done. It's basically a point on a graph where the differential of that point is equal to zero. Huh? Oh, more simply, a point on the graph where there is zero gradient. Now, where is zero gradient? Well, if you think about a uh, quadratic, well, here, as I move down, it's getting less and less negative, and then it gets more and more positive. So actually, at this very lowest point here, at the minimum of my function, we have a gradient equal to zero. And it just so happens that if I was to turn my smile upside down and to a frown, then once again, that maximum also has a gradient equal to zero. And that's really the crux of this whole thing. Let's have a look at a couple of graphs, All right? In this graph, there are three stationary points. Do you see them? Three areas where the gradient is equal to zero. Now, generally speaking, when you have a graph, which we have here, you can identify this visually. So here, ladies and gentlemen, is a turning point, all right? It's a place where the gradient goes from positive to negative, tiny kangaroo down sport. And here is a gradient that where there is zero, and lo and behold, there, once again, down that very bottom, are my three points where gradient is equal to zero, yes? Stationary points, I've used the term there, turning points. So when, if we're dealing with the idea that gradient is zero, where have I keep hearing this word gradient now? What one massive area of uh, methods or you know, pure mathematics or whatever you want to call it in, whatever country you're in, what area deals with finding the gradient? Oh yeah, differentiation, which is why this lesson's in the differentiation, no big hint. So we can differentiate the function and then solve it for zero. What do you mean solve it for zero? Remember, when you have y equals x cubed plus a half of x squared, for example, y dash was gonna be three x squared plus x. So this is actually taking sort of equation from the previous, previous one. If I now want to find where my turning points are, remember, we were looking for the point where m equals zero, but y dashed and m are pretty much the same thing. The gradient at a point, the differential is given by. So all I'd need to do was say three x squared plus x is equal to zero. And again, multiply out x or factor out x there gives me three x plus one equals zero. So I would know that x equals zero or x is equal to minus a third. Now, that's only my x values. But what that is now suggesting is I have two turning points. Would that make sense? Well, I should go, go. What is the graph? The graph starts as a cubic, and a cubic will generally have two turning points. A quadratic, which has a floaty x squared, will actually have one turning point. A graph of x to the four will generally have three turning points. Do you see the link? Yay, whatever the highest power is, take one, and that's the number of solutions you would generally expect for a cubic quartic or whatever it is. So, we would now, if we were drawing this graph, we would have to, for the examiner, now show the specific coordinate values of our turning points. Now, because I've chosen a revolting function, yes, and I suppose we'd have to admit that this function that I'm underlining now is pretty revolting, my turning point's gonna be pretty revolting. I would imagine in a method or pure exam, if you're lucky, you would end up with reasonably nice numbers. Now, I'm not saying whole numbers, but I'm saying something that could be written as a third or a fraction, something nice that will undoubtedly be manipulated earlier. So the point to all of this is that basically stationary points have a zero gradient and you can solve them by differentiating. Now, here we go. Here's a example using the CAS. Now again, use your CAS calculator if you can. I mean, I've already done an example here using pencil and paper, right? That's a very trivial example where we're given an equation 
You differentiate it, you put your m equal to zero, but not all of them are going to be trivial. So use the CAS. Those of you in the United Kingdom and any other country where you're not allowed to use technology, sadly, you're going to have to keep doing it by hand. But if we just go through each of the steps, let's call this step number one. That was my original function, a half x to the power of four plus x cubed minus three x squared plus five. That was my original function. I'm trying to find the turning points. I'm trying to find my stationary points. So when I'm finding my stationary points, I'm looking for where my gradient equals zero or y dash is equal to zero. There you go. Sorry, that's awkward. That's not y dash, Darren. That's a y. So y dashed is equal to, well, luckily, my CAS calculator, step number two here, can actually differentiate all this stuff for me. So it just so happens it's come up with 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 6x. Those of you who have to do it by pencil and paper, just looking at that, you can tell that this is obviously right. Having got that, now what do I do? Well, remember to try and find the stationary points. I'm finding the points where the differential is equal to zero. So I now solve by putting that equal to zero. So 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 6x equals to zero. I could actually have factorized out one of my x's. If we were doing this by pencil and paper, I've got 2x squared plus 3x minus 6 equals zero. Those of you who are doing it by pencil and paper would then go off and use undoubtedly the quadratic formula to be able to help with this. But what can we see? Yes, I can see that. This step here, step number three, where I use my calculator, I am solving my differential by putting it equal to zero for my value of x. And lo and behold, out drops my three solutions. So it has a turning point when x equals zero. That's good, because I already proved that. We have a turning point where x equals minus root 57 on four, minus three quarters, and x is equal to root 57 on four, minus three quarters. Now, is that my final answer? Uh, no. Remember, your calculator is only giving you the x values. The whole point of this, if we go back to this, is that it's given you zero, it's given you the 1.137 and the minus 2.637. That's it. You now need to go back and then find the y values. How do we do that? Well, again, remember, you have an equation that says to find the y values, take all of the x values and multiply by half to the power of 4 minus x cubed minus 3x squared plus 5. Yep, pretty ugly when you've got stuff like this. But those of you who have a CAS calculator can actually use this information, substitute it back into my original equation, and it will work out the y values for you. Alternatively, just, I don't know, put it into memory or do whatever you need to do. So the CAS will be invaluable in helping you to do this. Yes, you need to be able to do it by hand, but big fat tricks. Now, obviously, the questions will always try and trick you, and the best way to do this is to change the language. Now, over in Australia, we have this guy called Barry who sits in an office with no windows. He's got bad facial hair, a bit of a, you know, he's got literally no friends. And he's paid to try and confuse everybody by coming up with all sorts of different words. And here are some of the different words that he's come up with stationary points. Maxima, minima, maximum, minimum. So maxima, minima, I mean, really? They all sound like maximum. Local maximum, what does that mean? Well, if we look at a curve, while we might think that's the curve of x cubed, it could actually end up doing all sorts of stuff a bit later on, right? We don't know. So a local maxima is generally speaking a point on the graph that's local and has a maximum. Right? I can't explain it any other better. I'm sure there's lots of different ways of doing it, but likewise local minimum. And then we have this turning points business. Any of these can be used in a question. Alternatively, they might use other words that suggest the greatest point. I mean, again, greatest, maximum. Try and find all those words in your thesaurus that will help you sort of narrow down what the greatest and smallest is. Now, I think this is a great question where basically, uh, thanks very much to Cambridge, because I'm teaching from your course, I have borrowed this question without actually meaning to infringe your copyright. But it's a great, great question, right? This is where math started. Please don't think that we do sort of chapter one and then chapter two, and then chapter three in the book. And once we finish chapter one, we effectively close the box and ignore it, while we move on to chapter two, and then once we finish that, we close that box. All of these boxes absolutely interrelate, and you have to remember each content, or you've got to try and link all of this together 
to give yourself the best opportunity. All right, so as it's a cash course, my advice is learn how to use it. What do we got here? We've got an equation with y equals x cubed plus ax squared plus bx plus c. First thing I'm noticing here is I have three unknowns. I can guarantee, because I've done enough of these exams to know the difference, that they're going to be asking me to actually find the values of a, b, and c. Awesome. We know that it passes through the point 0, 0,5. Now, because I've got enough experience of this, I know that I can rewrite that equation of f of 0 equals 5. Why? Because I can also write this as f of x equals x cubed. That's what my calculator is going to need. And has a stationary point at 2,7. Now, big fat trick alert, like massive fat trick alert. Lots of people see the word stationary point and go, oh, oh, I know that when x equals 2, the gradient equals 0. And I'm like, yay, much respect. V is impressed. But what they miss is the fact that this point actually also lies on the curve. It has to. If it's a stationary point, it actually has a double roll. It's trying to trick you. So I also know that f of 2 equals 7 is really important for my original function. So how am I now going to use my calculator to help me through this to find the values A, B, and C? Bearing in mind it's talking about stationary points, which is differentiation, and a general equation. Well, first things first, I'm going to tell my calculator to define f of x as. So if you notice, all I've done is I've defined a function of x as that. The next function, I've suddenly found this g of x business. Why is g of x important to me? Well, we've got two different things the question's asking for me. I've got one function and I've got a stationary point. So what do I need to do? Where did this 3x squared plus 2ax plus b come from? Well, lo and behold, g of x is nothing more than f dashed of x. I've taken the original function and I've differentiated it. Now you can get your calculator to do this. Doesn't really matter how it does it, but what did I do then? I just wanted to check my calculator had g of x and f of x in its memory and actually as the right functions. And this shouldn't be a surprise. This f0 equals 5 and f2 equals 7 should not be a surprise. The CAS calculator here, I'm trying to solve a system of equations with three unknowns. And so I need to give it three pieces of information. But hold your horse teeth. I've got f of 0 equals 5. Yep, thank you very much. I know where that came from. f of 2 equals 7. Yep, I know that. But what is g of 2 equals 0 business? Don't we normally just put f, f, f? Well, we do. But we need to make sure that actually we tell the calculator we know the gradient function has a stationary point. Well, g, funnily enough, stood for gradient function. g of 2 equals 0 is nothing more than saying when x equals 2, my gradient is zero. Now again, it didn't have to be two zero. If the question told me later on that at x equals two, it had a gradient of six, well, that's fine. You would just change this zero to a six. But the last part is to tell my calculator that I want to solve for a, b, and c. And lo and behold, out pop my numbers. So what did this have to do with this boxes? Well, actually this now, this one question here is starting to split across a number of areas. There's algebra, there's differentiation, there's function, there's stationary points, there's using a CAS calculator, there's defining different functions, there's, oh, it's so much. But if you can do it, your methods exam or your pure exam or whatever exam you're gonna do will be easy as, well, a lot easier if you were trying to do it by hand. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for taking your time and listening. This has been Stationary Points. I look forward to seeing you next time. Hey guys, if you've enjoyed watching this video, why not tune in and subscribe to get updates of when I do other videos. Alternatively, click this video that's coming up now or just zip on over to mathsguru.com, M-A-F-F-S, guru.com, where you can actually access all the videos in a nice, easy-to-use way.